chose engineering mainly because I used to break things apart at home and my parents told me that like figure stuff out before you break them apart. I wanted to have a positive impact on the environment. I chose engineering because I wanted to work on projects that help benefit society. I think because I'm a fixer, like uh, basically at, at home whenever something breaks, instead of buying a new one, I just fix it or try to. Um, I like to think of myself as a problem solver. You know, I saw a lot of problems back in Charlotte with infrastructure, stuff like that. And it's a really easy way to tangibly see the stuff you're doing. I love to solve problems. I think that has been something consistently, something I enjoyed doing growing up. Mainly the people. Um, engineering's fun, learning how things work is fun, but you get to meet really interesting people here, interesting projects, learn about their dreams and help bring them to life. I love the variety in the different projects that I get to do, um, where I'm not working on the same thing every day, so every day is a little bit different. I love the flexibility my job brings the most. I have the flexibility of work from home, but also being in office with my coworkers. Um, I love, what I love most is, um, when something is finished building, like when we drive down into Charlotte, I would like point to my wife and I'd be like, I worked on that, you know, like, it's like, it's really fulfilling. Um, the people, I mean, there's so many great people around in our offices, always willing to help, always, you know, communicating. It's just a great working environment. Rocking everyone in fantasy football. <sighs> Biggest challenge is the responsibility that comes with, especially now being a PE. My biggest challenge is probably learning curves. Uh, there's a lot of intelligent people here and sometimes I get frustrated that I don't know as much as them, but I try and be patient and just learn as I go and try and absorb uh, from them and from all the work around me. Probably my biggest challenge when it comes to work is just managing between multiple disciplines, multiple people, staying on task with projects. It's the details. It's it's really crucial that you pay attention to the details. Probably the learning curve. There's so much nuance in engineering, so many things I'm learning day in, day out. It's a lot to keep up with, but it's really fascinating and entertaining. I think the attention to detail, um, being able to willingly learn and from your mistakes in the past while also being able to apply those in future jobs is critical in many of the projects we deal with. I am uh, Evan Connell. I'm a mechanical and plumbing engineer at Optima. And I'm Morgan Gunner, electrical engineer at Optima. So we're going to take a closer deep dive into exactly what our designs look like. We'll go through some plumbing, uh, fire protection, mechanical, as well as the electrical systems. So first, we're going to focus on one project we did at NC State uh, in their Partners One building. Um, just to give an example across all the different trades, what it looks like when we take an existing shell building, which is kind of one of the situations we can run into when we do a design, others being completely new construction, kind of similar to how y'all's project is um, with an open, open site. Um, and we can also do smaller renovation work where you keep most of the existing. This is more of a shell as it looks like in the picture. So we take that existing condition and the architect will kind of uh, get a, a schematic vision of what the project will look like. And that will help bring in the rest of the team so that we can start providing input on the engineering side of uh, limitations uh, if their design will work on this side or the other. And then we'll, the goal as a team is to then take this uh, rendering and this vision over to a new construction. And you know, as we bring the contractors on and they use our plans to help build this, hopefully it'll end up as the owner and the architect and the rest of the team is all envisioning the project to look. So starting out with plumbing engineering, uh, the plumbing systems in a building uh, can be the domestic hot and cold water system. So you know, when you turn on the sink, it's the hot and cold water that you see in your house. Um, it can get much more complicated in a commercial system, but that's the, the basic idea is, you know, just providing hot and cold water. Um, stormwater systems on a house would be a gutter to a downspout just out onto the ground. Um, you, with commercial buildings, we'll sometimes have that be a, a drain on the roof that pipes all that internally so it's not visible. And then it still has to kind of make its way outside the building and connect to something on the site that the civil engineer would design. And finally, when you bring water into the building and then have to get rid of waste and other things, 
Uh, we've got a sanitary waste system and venting for it. Um, but, you know, we'll have to design how that kind of routes to the building and then out and connects in with civil, along with the other utility systems, uh, natural gas piping, like on the far right picture, um, that plus other systems that we might have to bring in from the civil engineers uh, design into the building. You can see on the far left, those are pale green boxes. Those are what are called hot boxes that keep the um, water piping that goes above the ground to have valves and backflow for better devices, uh, hot when we have freezing temperatures. And then on the far right, we have a picture of a, a, a project we had with a commercial kitchen kind of in construction process. You can see all the different pipes that we had to lay out and uh, coordinate with other systems, including that yellow piping, which is the natural gas piping I mentioned earlier. And we'll have to kind of distribute that to different pieces of equipment in the building. So we see here on the left is an example of the demolition drawings that we'd have for that NC State project that I mentioned, um, and how that looks like as construction starts in the picture. You can see that there's systems that are already existing that we'll have to get to and modify for our new design. So they'll have to cut the concrete slab out and you know, our, our plum plumbing demolition drawings are helping guide the contractor on where those systems are and where they need to cut. And that transitions into our new construction design where we take what's left and what hasn't been demolished in our uh, uh, existing systems and we route the new piping to the new stuff that the architect has laid out. And that can be sinks, toilets, um, could be water connections for coffee machines, refrigerators, uh, all sorts of things. So moving on to fire protection and sprinkler systems. Um, so uh, our, our goal for the sprinkler system is to design it so that um, you can, in the event of a fire, occupants can get out of the building safely. Uh, in the time it takes to get everybody out. Uh, you know, there's a stretch goal so that you can also put the fire out and not damage the building. Um, but our goal, our main goal is the life safety aspect of it. You can see in the middle picture there, uh, there are some specialty sprinkler systems designed for if you have to run the piping inside of uh, unconditioned spaces like a parking garage. So this is a dry pipe system where it's actually full of compressed air rather than water. But then when a sprinkler head activates, uh, the water rushes into the piping and gets to the sprinkler head so it can put the fire out. And then on the far right, you see what's called a fire pump. So if a building is located in a remote location or somewhere where you don't have enough water pressure available to, to kind of push through the sprinkler system, uh, we'll have to design a fire pump into the system so that it can pressurize that water um, and provide how much we need to put the fire out. So similar to the plumbing drawings, our demolition drawings need to reflect kind of what's in the space existing, um, and then how we need to modify that existing system for the new layout and new design. So then we start, you, you, can, you can kind of see where that um, demolition drawing reflects what we see in the, in the picture on the right. So then when we look at the new construction, you have to, to look at the architect's layout and uh, adjust the fire protection system so that we still have the same coverage and everything is covered, even with new walls, new ceilings. So if there's a conference room with more people or a wall that kind of blocks where an existing sprinkler would have um, sprayed water, then we have to modify the system. In addition to if you have a lab or any place that stores something that's more flammable, or more dangerous, we have to make sure that the sprinkler system is designed properly to handle that extra hazard. So moving on to mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering relates to any systems that you need to take heat out of buildings or put it into buildings, condition the air basically, uh, as well as bring in ventilation to help flush contaminated air out of a building. Um, and then refrigeration when it comes to specifically not occupied stuff. So if you have like your refrigerator at home, the larger version of that for commercial kitchens um, can be more involved than just buying a, of an appliance. We can see in the top right, kind of a 3D view of a mechanical system in a building. I mean, it can look pretty complicated when you look at it like this, but uh, like any large uh, problem solving, you, you kind of have to take things bits and pieces at a time. 
So we might design kind of the pieces of equipment and then we'll have to design the, the gray sheet metal ductwork you can see in that uh, 3D view. And then the piping in kind of the black lines you see. And you can see in the pictures in the bottom, those are some examples of the ductwork in the middle. That is a direct relation to the gray that you see in the 3D view. And then the blue and white piping on the left, and on the right, it's in silver. Those are all water pipes to help bring heat. You circulate water to move heat around, essentially. So what is air conditioning you know, at the basic level? So when you're feeling cold in the winter, it's not you feeling cold. It's that it's heat leaving your body. You're losing your heat. So when you design an air conditioner, you're basically looking at the building kind of like how your body is. If you are losing heat and you're cold, you put on extra jackets, that's extra insulation. So what we as engineers have to do is we take the architect's design for the building and we look at heat gain or heat loss. You can kind of see in the diagram on the bottom left there, where in the summer you've got sun, uh, you know, solar radiation and heat coming from the sun through the window, coming into the walls and the roof as well as uh, heat being generated inside. So you have lighting and computers and even the people inside all, all create heat. So when you have you know, a certain amount of heat that is getting into a space to keep it cool, you have a heat pump system like we show the diagram on the right. Those are two different modes, either cooling or heating, just a basic uh, a diagram of how refrigerant piping moves from inside to outside and either pulls heat from inside in the summer and puts it outside or takes heat from outside and puts it inside in the winter. So when we're looking at kind of resiliency for those systems with flooding and hurricanes, obviously in flooding, you can kind of see in the diagram on the left and the picture on the bottom left, what happens when you have equipment that's kind of located in the basement, out of the way, uh, out of sight, it gets flooded uh, first. So one solution for flooding is often just bringing it up and putting it in a higher place of the structure. Um, you can kind of see the, the appliances and everything being moved up into the living area, you know, uh, the back of the living area. And then hurricanes present an additional wind damage uh, problem that you have to kind of account for with those outdoor units getting blown over or debris hitting them. So one solution that people have where hurricanes are a big problem, like the coast, is raising them the equipment up on platforms outside, as well as uh, providing kind of wind resistance, either metal tie down clips, like you can see in the very bottom of the units on the left, as well as on the right, it looks like this homeowner preparing for the hurricane coming, you know, shut their hurricane shutters over the window, but then they also added extra tie down strapping for their outdoor unit. Um, and these are certainly solutions to help protect against wind. Um, but, you know, if you have wind borne debris like branches and rocks and stuff, you know, that could still damage your equipment. So another solution to uh, kind of resiliency with flooding and hurricanes is to use what's called a geothermal system. And the added advantage being is that geothermal systems are also more energy efficient. So in this system, the uh, equipment takes the heat from the building or from outside, and it actually uh, puts it through water pipings into the ground. And so that uses the ground as your source of heat and cooling rather than using the air like a, an outdoor unit would use. And so this is a really good system to keep in mind possibly for your unit, for your project, um, the units in your project. So another uh, disaster consideration would be wildfires. So I mentioned ventilation earlier. Uh, if you have people breathing, generating CO2, um, you know, other contaminants, um, those all usually with our design get flushed out of the building using fresh air from outside. So in a wildfire situation, that outside air is actually worse condition than what your um, air quality is inside. So designing the systems to be able to shut that normal open ventilation and clean the air inside in a kind of a closed loop. And some of the system um, considerations you can include for that are uh, UV bulbs. So in the top left, those are UV um, um, bulbs that help, help kill microbes, uh, both on the coil and in the air itself. 
um, extra filtration. So you can see in the filter in the bottom left is a lot thicker. And you can see kind of what the process looks like with multiple filtration in the bottom right. You can use both mechanical filters as well as uh, carbon, which helps absorb some chemicals in the air. Um, so you can have multiple levels of filtration. And then another technology to consider is ionization in the top right, where in addition to that mechanical filtration, you kind of charge the air and the particles in the air um, with an electric current, and that helps take those charged particles and stick them to the collection plate so that it gets pulled out of the airstream. Um, for earthquakes, similar to what the structural engineering video mentioned about having to design the building structure to deal with the movement so that the building doesn't fall down and get um, you know, destroyed, uh, mechanical equipment inside the building will also have to be designed to kind of flex and move with the motions of the earthquake. You can see in the bottom left, that piece of equipment, that pump, was kind of bolted in place and fixed. And the earthquake movement really kind of destroyed the system and threw everything around. And on the right, that's a solution for that earthquake movement is providing kind of a base and a support for the pumps so that it can kind of shift and move along with the earthquake movement without destroying anything. And carrying out throughout the building from that equipment, your ductwork, you know, carrying air and piping carrying water can all be hung and supported from the building such that when the earthquake movement happens, it can move around without actually breaking the systems. All right, so moving into electrical engineering, we'll go over some topics and how uh, these can be applied to your project. The first topic we'll discuss is power distribution. The first thing I would consider is with your electrical service, do you want it to come in overhead or underground? Some pros and cons of both are overhead is subject to wind, storm damage, and other events like car accidents, but not it's, overhead is not subject to flood damage. It's also less expensive to install. Underground is pretty much the exact opposite. It's not subject to storm damage, but it is more expensive to install. Some other things to consider is like the location of your electrical equipment on site. Equipment such as utility transformers and emergency power generators are something that needs to be coordinated with the civil engineer to make sure they have they have planned for that equipment to be located on their site plans. Um, the next will be uh, material types. Uh, material type is very important for coastal projects. Steel rusts quickly when it's exposed to salt spray and salt water. Aluminum and stainless steel, on the other hand, are more corrosion resistant. So now we'll go into electrical rooms. So every device and receptacle that has an electrical connection also has to have overcurrent protection, such as a circuit breaker. Most circuit breakers are mounted inside of an enclosure called a panel board. You've probably seen a panel board, or it's sometimes called a breaker box, inside of your home. They're commonly found in garages or utility closets. Commercial buildings have several panel boards that vary in size. It is important to coordinate with the architect on where these panel boards are going to be located inside of the building. It is not uncommon to have multiple electrical rooms depending on the size of the building. So moving on to emergency power generation. Most emergency power systems are supplied by either a natural gas or a diesel generator. Some important things to consider when deciding between the two are, can a diesel fuel truck actually get to your site during a storm? Natural gas, on the other hand, is essentially unlimited unless there is a break in the pipeline supplying your generator. Keeping cost in mind, natural gas generators are typically more expensive than diesel. Another thing to consider is the location on site. 
keep, keeping in mind this project is at the, your project's going to be at the coast, you might want to consider locating the gener your generator on a platform, such as the image here on the uh, left side of the screen, or you could locate the equipment on the roof. Um, also, too, as I mentioned when we discussed power distribution, material types. Keep in mind the material type. It is recommended to specify your generator with a aluminum type enclosure or with a corrosion resistant finish instead of a steel enclosure. Renewable energy. So the two most common types of renewable energy for commercial buildings are wind and solar. Um, wind can be a uh, it can be a lot more expensive than solar, and it's also less efficient. The best bang for your buck, really, for commercial buildings is uh, is solar. It's going to be much more efficient, and it's going to be less expensive. Another thing to consider is battery storage. So solar, during the day, it's going to be constantly generating energy whenever um, you have plenty of sunlight. Usually there's an excess excess of amount of energy that gets put back onto the grid. Now, if you have a battery storage system, that excess energy can be stored and used at night when you're not generating power. So I hope that presentation has been helpful for you guys um, going over kind of the different mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. Definitely keep in mind for y'all's project when you're thinking about what those systems will look like, um, keeping the sustainable and resilient design considerations. And don't hesitate to ask any mentor or any questions you have about how you uh, integrate those designs into your um, project.